evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, today I'm basically going to share uh, the principles that I've learned in business. It's not something that I have, um, uh, it's basically my personal experiences that I'll share with you because I think it's always much easier to share what you've your personal experiences than something that you've read in the book or you hear about someone else. So most of the information that is here today is things that I have learned over the past um, seven years that we've been in business. Okay, who we are. Who we are, I think, slightly, slightly smaller than someone trying to imagine. company because obviously it's much easier to start with a field that you know much better. Um, I started the company at the age of 26 and um, it basically came through uh, an opportunity where a friend presented a project. So in architecture we call it um, private jobs. So I did the project after work almost every day for almost six months and um, after that the client basically increased the scope of work which basically led me into resigning and starting the company. In 2007, um, I actually invited a friend of mine to join me. So basically, we were two staff members. Um, 2009, we expanded into a property development company. The reason for that is that I had actually noticed that within the industry, you find that a lot of people offer self-services. And I wanted to create a company that is diversified, that is sustainable, on the long run. Um, 
grew that business into a multidisciplinary services offering in 2010, 2012, um, Staff complement had grown into 34 full-time professionals. 2012, AKG Indigo Kulani Group um, wins the PBQ Best Established SMMP Award, and I was honored by um, uh, by winning the Businesswoman of the Year 2012. 2013, about um, three weeks ago, we um, contacted by Topco. Media was that uh, we basically be voted the top 300 empowered companies in our country. And you will see below that um, we have a four letter which is very key to our company, which is building people, spaces, places, and spaces, which I will explain further why we have these four. What we do again is architecture, is project management, is quantity surveying, civil and structural engineering project finance, property development, and uh, something that is very close to my heart is the Educational Foundation. <coughs> Our clients um, basically range from AFSA, DEFCO, DBSA, Department of Education. Um, about two years ago, we were appointed by the Housing Department of Education and DBSA to basically um, design and, um, and plan for 91 new schools in Kauteng and 272 existing schools. And all that we're able to do it through our partnerships that we have with various leading companies in the country. Um, Oracon, uh, NHFC, BTKM, Bigger, Give, Deloitte, um, basically our partners. And I'll explain to you why specifically we, we, cho we have chosen to go with the partners that we have. Um, about what we'll discuss today, basically, I'll go through the uh, basic principles of studying a business. <laughs> um, through my experience, the importance of having a vision and its purpose, understanding the crucial developmental stages of the business, aligning the business culture and brand to the vision, social responsibility, doing good while we're doing business. Studying a business. Um, I think in our country we, we live in a, obviously coming from where we come from and um, we've transformed into a new country where uh, there are opportunities for basically all South Africans. Um, it's very important that when one wants to go into business, you define why you want to go into business and it's very clear. It has to serve a bigger purpose than a personal need. Um, in as much as sometimes we don't believe it, some people choose to go into business because I think I want that car, I want a big house, I want to live in Clifton, you know. But if that, um, if those are the reasons for basically going into business, it will not be sustainable because eventually you will eat from your seeds and you will not be able to grow and um, have a sustainable business going forward. Um, is the need more realistic in the market? Um, you know, as entrepreneurs, sometimes you find that you have dreams and you have ideas. But it's very important, it was very important for me specifically to say, can I add value in the, in the, in the economy, in our society? So um, I put this in because I think it's very important that when one has a vision or you have a passion to do something, you, you define how it's going to fit into um, the market as well. Uh, a lot of people say they can't go into business because they need money. I started a business without any capital and I still believe that vision is much more important than capital. Vision and its papers. Um, I've met so many people in business, especially in, um, in Joburg. You find that I'm not sure how things are in Cape Town, but in Joburg you realize that a lot of people, again, um, in the way they run businesses, in the way they conduct themselves in business, you realize that you don't know what people stand for. And I will actually go into that um, when we discuss brand and culture within the business environment. So uh, here I'm saying that vision is the primary motivator of any human action. Vision influences how we conduct our entire lives. It gives us values. So even as you 
continue to do business with people. Um, I mean, obviously as you grow, I've met so many opportunities and uh, offers, you know, and every time they come in, I have to say to myself, is this in line with what I want to achieve? You know, is this in line with the legacy that I want to leave in business? So it's very important for me, the vision that I have for our business, it basically keeps me focused. Um, it has given me values and priorities. I know what to prioritize, you know. Um, with my first paycheck for my client, I didn't buy a new car. <laughs> so it, it helps you to basically try and ground yourself and prioritize what is important in your life. Um, vision is the embodiment of purpose and passion. A lot of people, again, it's very important to define your vision because um, in most cases, we all have passions, different passions, and um, one of the things that we are trying to do through our educational foundation is to basically set up a, to try and get the young people to basically pursue their careers within their passion, not because your uncle is a doctor, so therefore, or your father is an architect, so therefore become an architect, because I believe that is the reason you find that there's a lot of unhappy people that are successful in their careers. So um, I think it's important that people follow their passion and within business, for me, the, my passion is basically to give back to in, into the community, into our society. And through the passion for business, I'm able to do that or try to do that. Um, obviously, you can never raise capital without a vision. Unless, obviously, you know someone at the bank or your father owns the bank. Um, however, you can start a business without capital. And I've seen it, like I've said, I've seen it with my, whole, with my own life. And you will see with the images that I have here, it's just basically to say vision basically gives you your values. It gives you direction. It gives you, um, it, 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 it helps you to prioritize things within, um, within the business. Understanding the crucial developmental stages of a business. This is very crucial because um, I realized that sometimes people regard a business as it's just a money making or a way to be able to, to probably make money. But I have I actually decided to take a different view, and my experience is that a business is a living entity. Um, to understand the business developmental stages, I, I sort of had to take it and interpret it as how does a human being develop? You've got different needs at different stages of your life, so is the business. In the beginning, like a small child for those that of you that have children, it takes everything and it doesn't give back, you know? So you have to learn to basically sacrifice. Um, you must be willing to sacrifice some of your personal needs for business growth. So you find that, I mean, when I started, I remember I had an old computer and uh, a friend of mine uh, uh, took me out for dinner and after dinner, so I was in Jobek, we put our bags in the boot. I'm not sure about Cape Town, it's a little bit safer. So he said to me, so what are you doing with your computer in the boot? I'm going to fix it. I was like, no, I'm going to work at home. I was like, where's the laptop? How can you unpack the whole computer? I was like, this is how I'm doing things now. <laughs> you know, and um, I could have probably taken my first, my first paycheck and buy a laptop. But for me, it was more important to basically, I knew that it didn't really take a lot for me to dismantle the whole computer and put it in my boot work at home and do the same in the morning and I knew that the time will come in, it will come with hello, a, a MacBook. <laughs> yeah. Um, start small, keep your expenses low, grow gradually. It's something that most of us we live in again, we're living in times where there's always a new phone, a new computer, a new everything. So um, people want to already start and be incentive. I mean, like, that's in Jobek. I'm not sure about Cape Town, but renting big offices, hiring too many people too soon, you know. So 
And I've seen so many businesses actually fail through that. I had a client who basically, especially, and I've seen this with some of the top executives that leave um, the corporate world as chairmen or CEOs, CEOs of big companies. And um, what, what they do is that they decide to go on their own, but they, ex they sort of like want to have the same things they did while they were working for a big corporate. And obviously they had that big, huge office because it's a, it's a corporate that they're working for. But once you start on your own, you have to start, basically have to go to the beginning where you have a small office, everything is basically small and you don't have to mind about your friends, what they will say. So I've seen a lot of people, I had a client who basically rented a huge office and had a huge car. You, you would fly business class. When you start your business, you fly business. You, you you fly economy. You know, and it doesn't matter who says what. You know, so it's very important. I think it's a mistake that we find that a lot of businesses probably don't grow uh, or go under. Uh, you know, in less than two years. Just like no one is above the law, no one is greater than the business or the vision within the business world. So, and this, I think, it's important for the visionary or for the person who has started the business to know that you are also an employee of the business. So you don't um, go around and use the business account as a personal account, you know. You realize that you're just accountable like everyone else. The, the difference is that you're a shareholder and probably the, the other people are basically non-shareholders. But at the end of the day, you need to differentiate yourself from the business, that I mean, for your the business. Um, let your passion and purpose keep you focused in times of changes, opportunities, and challenges. I think this is so crucial because um, if your vision is not well defined, you might find that um, you get different offers. You know, people will call you, oh, you know, I this a bid to supply, I don't know, containers to pick it up and I'm like we don't supply containers to pick it up I don't care who you know and pick it up but we're not going to submit the bid with you because I think it's so important to just keep to your vision so that I mean you see we are a multidisciplinary company but it's within the built environment we don't we're not into oil we're not into energy or anything like that and that just helps to grow the business because at the same time, if you don't diversify, you have a problem because, I mean, we have experienced the same challenge as well in the past two years where um, the private sector in terms of property development has basically slowed down people um, and government as well is not really spending that much on the design of new buildings. However, there are a lot of opportunities in terms of infrastructure development in our country or in other um, African countries. So you find that our engineering uh, department and public surveying department will continue to basically get work while the architectural department is almost like barely surviving. So it's very key to obviously diversify within the industry that you know. There's some people that are quite um, obviously much more, um, I think, uh, uh, what would I say, they're much they, they can take the risk of basically going into different industries, but we have uh, specifically um, decided to stick within the built environment and we think that the cake is big enough. How did we do it? Um, I think for us it was, I think the past, the first two years, it was crucial for us to understand the market in terms of doing business because initially, I was obviously an employee of the company, so I didn't understand what was going on, even though I was reading a lot of material to try and prepare myself in terms of understanding what's going on in the market. So it's very important to understand the politics. And for me, the politics is not very politics as in like the government politics, but it's the politics of the business world. Who is, who are the big five in your industry? You know, who are the big 10? Who controls the industry? You know, you need to understand their strategy, how have they grown and all that. Understanding the country's laws and its changes as an SME is also important. I've seen that a lot of SMEs, because they're small, they think they will remain small for the rest of their lives or 
you know, and um, they don't get to understand the changes that happened. There was a time, um, I mean, it was, you know, when um, government had uh, the laws of BEs and it changed to broad based, you know, so you, you begin to, you have to obviously understand what's happening in the market and obviously try and see what are the opportunities that uh, present themselves for you to be able to, to partner with other people that may mean something from you and the, and the, and the relationship can be beneficial. Um, we applied the law of association and that goes back to our, to, to our partnerships, you know. Uh, we never saw competition, rather we saw synergy. So we understood, we basically had to define who are the, who are the guys that are actually, or who do we want to, um, you know, you almost want to find some, it's almost like in your personal life where you, you, you find someone to look up to or a mentor. And for us, we had to look at companies that are already doing what we're doing, and they're doing it very well. And what we did is that we started uh, forming relationships with them because if we want to be great like them or great, uh, we have to basically learn and work with them. So we, we then, um, obviously, that's, what, that's why I'm saying that we apply the law of association. We never saw competition, rather synergy. So what we do, we basically approach them. And we've seen our company grow through that. You know, we don't work in isolation. So we will go for bigger projects. And in a big project, we we'll do a small amount of work because for us, that is good enough. Because we just want to learn how it's done. Um, we part, like I said, we partner with industry lead companies. Um, reinvest into the business through quality skills and excellence. When you're starting, of course, you can't afford those experienced people because they come quite expensive. But as you grow the business, you know, it's very important to remember the needs of the business, you know, and, um, and like I said, it's very easy to easily sort of remember your needs and forget the needs of the business. You know, if you take your business, you take care of you one day. <laughs> you know, like in the African culture, you know, you send your child to school, they graduate, they start working, they have to come back and build a double story. So business is like that. Um, continuous professional and personal development of our staff. Even though we're young and we're small, and um, I've seen a lot of, in, in the past, I've only worked for small companies, and specifically because I knew that in a smaller company, you are able to basically get involved in the full life cycle of the project. And I've learned that sometimes small companies find that they get consumed into the growth of the business and they forget about the needs of their staff. And, um, and it's very small things that one needs to look at. I mean, um, about two years ago, we had a lady who came in after, I think, six months. She um, gave us her resignation. Same day, I accepted it. And then she came back the following day. She said it was basically constructive dismissal. And um, why did the lady want to resign? She wanted more money. She thought maybe I would raise basically try and counter offer. Unfortunately, I do not use the principle of counter offering our business because I believe when one resigns, you have, should have a vision. So the, I think the idea and the principle of vision, we try and share that with our staff as well through our workshops to say you have to have a personal one as well. Because this is the bigger vision, which is the company. What is your personal vision? And you need to see if it ties up with this. If it doesn't, then it's not, I'm not firing anyone, but it's rather you look for it and you can leave because you're much more happier when you see when you see progress in your personal life as well and not just see the company progressing and thinking, hmm, my boss is living large and I think I'm frustrated and all that, you know. So we try and do that. So when a person resigns in our company, we do not negotiate. We 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 believe that you have actually thought about it and you believe it's time for you to leave. And so through that, we realized that people have um, financial problems, you know, and it's not, you know, most of us, you find that in the way we spend and everything, and they always say, I'm not being paid enough. So what we've done, part of the things that we've done in our company is that 
we have um, engaged a personal, um, a financial coach who comes in and helps our staff members basically plan their, their budgets and all of that because then it's much easier for, for them as well because people spend more time, we spend more time training people, new people, and then after five months, the basic job hopping because they need that extra 500, that extra thousand. And I think the time that you spend in terms of training people and spending time, you are actually losing as a business owner because you start, you start to take over that is too high. <coughs> business culture, brand, and vision. Um, here, basically, it's just to, it's obviously brand, culture, vision, it talks about who you are as a person, you know, and I say it's very important for one to decide very early what you want to be known for, you know. Um, we, so for us, we want to be known as a company that has a social conscience in our society. Um, it is very important to continuously share the vision with your staff. You know, you find various ways to be to be able to communicate that to them so that they're not just coming to work to tick the box. I was here from eight until five, so tomorrow you do the same thing again. Um, involve all members of your organization in your journey. We try and do this even with our cleaners. Okay, maybe now that we're still small, we can do that. But basically, we try and involve them. Even when she's cleaning, she needs to know that we do it like we have to do it on time. It has to be done properly, you know, and all of that. So it's very important that you don't leave anyone behind. Um, use various medium of communication to let your staff, your partners, and the public know what you're doing, because this helps us. First of all, it gets our staff to understand that this is a vision. It's a growing vision. We're going somewhere. Partners, um, they're able to see that you're growing, they're, they're adding value into your business as well. I remember when we were, um, we were uh, published by BBQ last year, and we mentioned the schools as well. Um, Oracle is our partner. They were the lead partner on the, on, in the project. They're very happy to know that we mentioned and we acknowledge the fact that they're playing a role in our business and they've helped us to basically go to the next step. Um, the public, this can include basically potential partners that you probably would like to partner with. Once they know that, oh, there's this company, this is what they're doing, they've partnered with that company, they might be doing something right, you know, so it just helps to grow the business as well. As a leader, lead by example, people learn more from actions than we're stuck on their walls. I remember um, I had an issue with one medical aid, which I'll not mention. And I was very frustrated and I went to their offices and there were so many, there was, um, they had a wallpaper that was stuck there, it was talking about integrity, it was talking about all sorts of things. And I was sitting there and I was like, does this guy understand what's on the wall? You know, because I don't think he gets it, you know. So I think it's very important to find various ways to basically communicate what you stand for. Doing good while doing business. Um, this is something that we're very passionate about um, as a company. Um, we've, we basically started in 2007 to basically start doing this, where we looked, we basically took the kids from childhood and families in Caltonville and would help them to get into um, university. At that time, obviously, we didn't have a lot, so what we would do is that we'd help them to get registered and guide them how to apply for NEPSAS and all that. Um, we run a skills development program uh, to high schools uh, called Champions. Um, we, one of the things, I remember I went to um, the China Construction Bank and I was talking to somebody there, and we then started talking about the issue of crime in our country. And for me, I started thinking about, you know, the reason, I mean, I'm not, you in. In, in Johannesburg, you find that people, the people that come and want to break in at night, they don't come when you are at work. They want you to be at home. So you realize that actually there's no value in life. So what we're doing is that we're trying to target high schools and we try and almost want to add hope and say, we give someone a vision. When you have something to live for, you don't risk your life. But you find that when there's nothing to live for, 
what if I go in and get caught, they kill me, so what? You know? So we're trying to basically give almost a vision of hope to these kids while they're still in high school. Uh, we partner with various educational-based um, NGOs because our focus is on education. So um, I believe there's so many other people that are doing various things out there, good work to, to people, but for us it's educational-based. So what we'll do with primary school kids, because that is much more time consuming, we just partner with the organizations that are already working with the <coughs> primary school kids, so we we'll provide things like school uniforms at the beginning of the year, or basically the feeding schemes, so <coughs> that's what we do. Offer internships to students within the built environment, because it's much easier we're within the built environment. Um, our purpose is to make a social and economic changes in our society because we want to educate somebody eventually the economic status will change uh, hopefully. So yeah, so that's what we do. And that's the end. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations on the wonderful thing that you have achieved. Well, what, what my real question is, how can we get zero reach out of this year? We need another thousand sibling kids like you. We need desperately entrepreneurs here. And even in the state, in the sort of public service, South African Airways needs people with vision. SABC needs people with vision. So how can we get this vision to get another thousand sibling kids? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Sibongi. My name is Musia Pascal uh, Musia, and I'm the chairperson of the Private Media Human Development uh, London and Organization. Uh, the question that I will pose to you is what is, it, what is the difference between right, owning a business and acquisition of skills? So the world of business is changing, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, the first one, I think um, the, one of the ways that I believe, that's obviously my personal opinion, and um, that's why I, um, the, I did share it with you, is that I'd like to, what we would like to do in the future is to build a leadership school. Very similar to the Oprah one, but the difference is that we don't want to train leaders in isolation because I realized that all of those girls that are being trained right now, they're all going to probably give back to the US or the UK. And what I realized is that when you train people and you give them the best skills in terms of imparting vision and purpose in them, but we basically don't remove them in their communities, they're able to remember and they're closer to the needs of the communities. That's why I think I was able, I think if Maybe my parents had the opportunity of sending me to Switzerland, for example. I don't think, maybe I would, but possibly I would have probably used my skills day and I would have different needs. But because I schooled in Bedford View High School and stayed in Soweto, I went there to get the education, but I came back home and I saw the needs that I was in the community. That's why I'm able to stay closer to the needs. Okay, the second one, the second question, um, what is the difference between owning a business and acquisition? And acquisition of skills, since the world is changing, hence uh, 
a large number of so-called black businesses, in fact, like uh, are going down in salt, in fact, are dying, in fact, are going down in nurses. What I'm trying to do is very sad that it's not simple, what is the fact that it's not? Now, the question is in terms of what, in terms of, like, as you, as the business proprietor, the business owner, in fact, like, do you see the need for skills in fact, in position? Okay, I'll, I'll try and answer it to my best of my understanding. Um, I think it's important, what we've done in our business is that we, because the, the, our vision is to obviously be able to train people in terms to get people to be skilled, right? So it's very important that when you're running a business to have that balance within the business, you know? Like I said, that when we were starting a business, we had basically youngsters because that's what we could afford. But as you grow, you need to understand that, okay, I cannot be partnering with maybe, I don't know, Deloitte, and you start bringing 21-year-old only as a project, it really requires certain kind of skills. So you, ha you have to look at your skill set within the business. Yes, it's expensive because when you look at your budget, you think, oh my goodness, I'm paying these three people so much. But you know that you're actually investing in the business. And once you finish that project, those people are going to come back and buy it. We have grown and we have gotten more projects through invitations by those partners that I mentioned earlier on. And not because we have tended, because we find that most of the projects would be much bigger for us to be able to handle alone. And also, uh, I also assist you with the fact that in terms of mitigation of the original program, in fact, like in terms of, it's also known fact that many young people want to become business owners. But you said that like uh, so you also assist them to become business owners. We we do, but I think more than assisting young people, for now our focus is not entirely on assisting young people to become business owners, but it's to assist them to the vision. What is it that they want to do? You know, because first you have to define that. Because when you talk to a lot of, especially young people, just young graduates, everybody wants to be a business owner because more, and most of the time it's about the new car and the new everything, you know? But once you give a person a vision, you realize that you have to nurture it, you protect it, you become so defensive over it, you know? So you forget about everything that is actually going to take you down the drain because you want this thing to grow, you know? Hi, um, yeah, it's been incredibly inspiring seeing how you actually, in a sense, spread the social sustainability of everybody um, continuously linked to the value of the vision of the company. Um, but I was a young architect, and I was just wondering also how actually in the development of actual architecture is um, the social sustainability and the idea of a vision connected with the client? And um, because often the client in the end is the bank <laughs> or you know, the property developer and there's this huge gap in architecture, especially in South Africa, between the social needs and the kind of vision of a future uh, of relationships that can be formed within the actual architecture and program of the building. So I just wanted to see how, in a sense, if you had a community building, how would you develop a vision of the community in order to create the right brief for the architecture to happen and that way facilitate social sustainability within your actual practice uh, rather than within the business of your practice. And then also just a second adjunct to that, like for instance in the UK, we've got a policy of like 15 or 20 percent of a building to be so it should be, you know, it's given away to social stuff. Like if there's any other kind of indication of that you think out of your practice, um, you know, what would it be? I can take a second. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stand up. My name is Lufefe. Uh, I'm from the company by the name of Spinach Innovation. I'm the founder. It's a uh, healthy spinach production company. Um, I read about you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I'm grateful to see you. I read about you uh, last year when I was doing entrepreneurship development here in the RAA. It was inspiring to make learn about such a caliber of that. Uh, my question would be, you know, I'm still a startup and I'm on the ground. So my question would be, how long did you, because I heard that uh, you are the most empowered business at the moment, 
uh, you got the award. So my question would be, how long did it take you, to you, you know, on the ground before you get to the place where you are now? And what kept you going from that ground to where you are in the moment? That's, that's why I'm interested in. Thank you. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, all right. Um, okay, regarding the architectural field, I think architects have always had um, a bigger role to play in our society. And um, in terms of architects adding value or giving back within our society, um, I think that is something that, especially in housing, um, most of the especially, um, what would I say, the, the, department, the Department of Housing, they have a lot of subsidiaries that are trying to basically get property developers, architects, to get together, to be able to create almost like a, and, and involve the community in what architects are doing. I'll, I'll give you an example. We're currently involved in a project um, with Housing Partnership Fund. What they do is that they look for small property develop, uh, developers, right? And then they help you to basically, you obviously have to identify the piece of land that is within, that is within um, a community that, uh, what will I say, middle, I would say sort of low middle income. And you identify a piece of land, what they will do is that you, they will help they will help that developer to be able to um, develop a develop. It's not social housing per se, but it's rental units. But the way we do them is that you are able to create, you are able to involve the, the, the community because what we did is that we went into Pinoy and we looked at if we choose this piece of site, how close is it from transportation? How close is it from um, cases of health. Uh, is there a clinic close by? Is there a shopping center close by? All those things, because remember, they already set the rent out for those units. And then they say to you, you have to look for a piece of land that is going to make sure that it doesn't eat into the pocket of this person who's already earning less. So already as you, as you design as an architect, you start thinking about the person who will live there. So you start thinking about how many kids they would probably have. So it's somehow, I, I believe that somehow, as a developer and as an architect for our, our, as an architectural company for our company, is that already we are adding value into the society by having this almost guidelines of how do we design a, sus a sustainable um, quality development that at the same time it will add value into the long run of the person who will occupy the, 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 the property. I think that's my... Right. Also, what, sorry, can I ask you to bring the mic, please, but I see one of our mics is progressed, but also it doesn't come through the field here. Um, so perhaps we can ask you a second question on that different answer, yes. Thank you. Um, should I? I wanted to make 
a social and economic development in, in our society, right? And I have to define that, and you will see, as it just that I didn't obviously um, mention our project. Specifically, I do not market um, our company into property developers that do fancy buildings in Maryland's art, because that is not what we want to do. What we want to do is that we are skilled, we're a company that is skilled, and we want to go back into the communities and actually be able, I mean, for us to be able to do, we do mostly schools, we do clinics, we do um, hospitals. So it's all about all of our projects. Oh. Yeah, all of our projects are, are all socially and economic, almost socially or orientated because it's about making that difference in the communities, you know. So for us to be involved in the planning of the 91 new schools in Gauteng, it's about using our skills that we have within our company to say, how do we design the blueprint? I mean, the schools that are being, okay, that are being built, the designs, we did the designs as to how the quality is being um, implemented. <laughs> we can't take credit for that because there's some horrible stories. But for us to be involved in being able to apply the green principles within those schools, being able to understand how, how do we want, I know the school that I went to. You know, I mean, it was in Bedford Green High School, but still, you know, it's almost like it's an institutional arrangement where you go in there and there's no fun about it. And school should be fun because that's where you spend most of your time as a young person, you know? So we had to start designing and we communicate those principles to the client. And we feel that for us, it was an opportunity because if you're appointed to, to basically create a blueprint for the country in terms of the schools, um, it's an opportunity where you're able to communicate that or communicate or maybe make that difference that you want to make within the communities. Um, for us to be able to when we designed, we were appointed to design um, Phoenix as well. You sit and you basically are able to think about how you want to use the Phoenix. So you don't have, so we just don't get one opportunity. But for us to be able to do those kind of projects with serve a much greater community, that's our vision. Our vision is to be able to do that. Our vision is to be able to um, get the young kids to be able to go to school. That's why we have specifically uh, chosen to, to start an educational foundation and not any other foundation or a training center for mothers or for fathers or for ex, you know, ex or whatever. You know, we are just focusing on just school kids because that's our passion, that's our future. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, how did I um, <laughs> get off the ground and <laughs> get on the ground? <laughs> Yeah. Um, again, it goes back to um, you know defining your vision. For for me, I wanted. I had had so many terrible stories, especially. I mean, I don't want to mention this, but especially about black businesses. You know that oh, they fail, the quality is not good and everything. I said, you know what, I want to establish a company that is going to be different. A company that will have principles, that stands for something that is greater than me, you know? So I think for me, hence that's why I'm saying we do social, we are involved in a lot of social projects. Because social projects, those schools, they have nothing to do with me as a person, but they serve a greater community. So for me, that it was very important to define it very early. And when you define it early, somehow life is a way of just coming together. Um, secondly, I think it takes sacrifice as well. You know, um, when you start, you need to understand that. I mean, I remember there was a time, obviously, when I was studying, I was working for a company. So I was renting in Sunning Hill, and we had a small little office. And um, uh, at, at a certain point, I was thinking, you know what, I can't afford to rent. It's either business would have to go to the boots, or I go to the boots. <laughs> so I went back home, Mr. Weto, you know, and I stayed at home, and the business 
had offices and everything. People didn't ask me where I lived, they asked me where the business was located. That was more important than anything else. So it's just examples of those small changes, but they're very big going forward because you learn to sacrifice very early. Yes. Um, Sorry, uh, we have many people still watching. So we have a gentleman there, gentleman there, and then I'm coming across to that side. Hi, my name is Novoyo, and my name is Kandi from Siluno. And the question that um, I want to ask from the main question is more on uh, how do you manage uh, the growth of the business with the opportunity that you see and also with the social economic problem that we are facing as your heart is bringing hope and giving probably a vision. How do you make sure that um, you continue doing what you could do it in terms of the foundation but also you also doing very well in terms of growing your business. And two, as we're talking here, how it probably in terms of systems and processes and your people to believe in your vision, to make sure that in years to come, where you employ about 100 people, those people that you have, they still believe in your vision. Uh, thank you, Swami, for gracing us with your presence. It was really, really motivational what you just said earlier on. But my question relates more towards um, how do you get young people to gather around <coughs> Like, from what you said, it seems like you initially started on your own, right? And then once your vision picked up traction, you then involved other people. But I find, being a young person myself, uh, it's very hard to get young people around together to get something done because they tend to be overzealous, they tend to be over ambitious. So now my question is, how do you manage that process, that very critical stage of a vision's takeoff when you have other people involved? How do you get them to be on the same page? Or what lessons could you share with us from what you had to go through from your side? in terms of how you kind of everyone around the vision and made them believe and also made everyone part of it. Okay, I'll start with the first one. Um, okay. <laughs> I think um, with the foundation, um, I also had to learn very early that it's almost like um, you always have people suffering in the world but as long as you can make a difference to anyone close to you or, you know. So for, for me, I understand that we are not going to be able to do this alone, but you can only make a difference. That's all you can do. So that's what the foundation is there to do, to make a difference, not to solve the whole problem. <laughs> um, and um, the second one, sorry, I didn't get that I don't find also to um, you know is to what I've done I'll just give you an example of what I've done what I've done is that I've actually gathered people that share the same vision in terms of first of all you have to get your management to share to understand the vision the HR lady she needs to understand why she's there not just hiring and firing people the finance person, they need to understand that it's not just the numbers, you know, it's about a bigger vision. You sell and continuously empower those people because I cannot, eventually as we grow, I cannot go to the HR assistant and actually tell it, this is what we need to do and all that, you know. So it's very important to understand and find 
means of communicate, commun communicating with your staff in a way that there are no, it's possible that obviously certain people will not buy into the vision. Not everyone is going to buy into it. But your key people, they will buy into it. And, um, and just continuously share with them and try and identify people that are potential to your business. You know, you find young people as well that share the same passion. You know, they might not understand the vision, but they have the passion. And it's a matter of grooming that and actually making sure that you do things that show them that you care about them as well. I mean, like, to get their financial coach, a lot of companies don't do that. But for us, it was like, you know what, we know that this might be a problem to us because if people spend half of the time looking for jobs instead of doing their work, it's a problem. So how do you try and actually get them to understand that you're not the enemy? Because when a person gets into a financial problem, the first enemy is the employer. You don't pay me enough, you know? So we try and get enough sort of things that we can, you can only do your best to try and actually share with the people that, you know what, we actually do care about you, even though we don't have to write it down there every day to say we care about you, you know, but it's those little things that we do. Um, the third question, it's very difficult. I mean, I started the business at 26, and um, obviously at 26, you have nothing. <laughs> So you're probably going to hire your people, your age mates and all that. Then eventually, you know, they ask themselves, who do you think you are? You're the same age with me and now you want to, you know, all those things. But it's very important to be consistent and actually to be able to show leadership. And people as we continue to do that will respect you because respect, everything is end. You know, you can't tell people you have to respect it, but it's just the way you conduct yourself and conduct your business. And people will buy into that. And those that don't buy into that, they will leave. And it's okay. Right, we have this gentleman and that gentleman. Um, hi, this one. Hi. Uh, my name is Tim um, My question is actually about uh, skills development. But it kind of starts off in uh, talking about um, starting a firm about capital. So the idea is um, you were saying earlier that you can start a company without capital. And the thing is, um, in order to do that, it's much easier if let's say you have intellectual capital, right? Uh, which is basically what you have. You have intellectual capital, which is much cheaper than anything else, and therefore you could start your business that way. Um, and at the same time, there's a matter of exposure. So if you have a great deal of exposure, you can think of different ideas, and you can find the one that easily ties up with your vision. So my actual question is, um, how do you take that into account? when you're dealing with skills development, you're dealing with giving someone a vision, um, because you have to try and deal with giving them enough exposure, and at the same time, trying to give them enough um, skills to be able to pick something that works best for them. Um, should I assume it's a question? Yeah, um, my, my one's really easy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my name's Nicholas, I'm from Media Sensiali. Um, I, Kulani Indigo, I'd like to know what the name means. Um, and then, what is your vision and uh, for expansion into Africa? How enthusiastic are you about the rest of Africa? Thank you. <laughs> this is easy. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, that's fine. I think, yeah, the way we have done it is that, because we have a number of young people in our company. Um, it starts when we recruit them. We look for talent because when you have talent, you can actually nurture it, but only if it's willing. They need to be willing to learn as well. So what we do is that we try and, like I said previously, that we balance the school sets that we have within our company. So we look for talent, we look for passion, and once they have that, the rest is easy to do. But if the person does not have the talent and the passion, those are the difficult ones because you have to tell them what to do. So most of the time we'll have, we have work, we can team them up. We have what we have. We have a program in our company that we just started this year. It's the Young Achievers Program. So what we do is that out of the young people, we choose 
um, the ones that have more passion. <laughs> so what we do is that we then um, and and more and then what we do is that we then say we have just appointed a young guy. He's the the leader of the young achiever in our company. So what he does is that he has the meetings with the young with the with the interns. So he's able to share with them, and they're much more comfortable than sitting with me and sharing these things with them because they all keep quiet. But I know if they're sitting with Keith and he's sharing with them, they get to understand more because they can relate with him and they're thinking, oh, Keith is almost like the same age with me. And then once I'm there or anyone else is like, oh, you know, our boss is there, so we just keep quiet. So you never get anything. So we have various ways as well to get the young people to, to get involved and buy into the vision. Um, Indigo Kulani. Kulani means growth in Tonga. I'm Tonga. <laughs> So um, basically, I I wanted I saw the business growing. So and I believe you have to say the things you want, and it's really a vision. You have to write it. I have a, a vision board at home. So every morning as I leave, I see that framed it. Everything you know about this is what I live for, and so important, so encouraging. So when things I don't, they don't seem to be going well. You remember, this is where I'm going. So even if they're not, they're not, they don't seem positive right now, but the vision board is something that I'll encourage some of the young people to have if they can. You know, just put everything you want there and frame it and put it there, and it's amazing. I've seen things happening. Um, growing into Africa, whew, we're quite ambitious. <laughs> we started in 2008, we did a a project with that client of mine that I was talking about that was spending a lot that we eventually went, went under. We were doing a, we did a project, um, it was basically a, a, a design of a golf course, we, it was a consortium in Abuja, um, and a hotel in Abuja, we have uh, done some concept for uh, a client in, um, in uh, Lubango in Angola. Um, so we are, we are basically, Africa is something that we, um, it's basically a territory that we're growing into. We started in 2008, we were two years old then. And you realize it's different. The, the culture of doing business there is very different. But the good thing is that we're basically protected because we were the consultants and then someone else was taking a bigger risk. But we made, we made sure that we're not taking the risk. So the client would pay for us to get there. We did some work in Tanzania as well. So it is uh, um, a case that we're going into. And I think just starting early has helped us to identify certain countries and different cultures within those countries that we think these are a little bit easier to sort of get into. And these are a little bit of a difficult goal to actually go <laughs> Yeah. We're taking our last two questions, Mark and Stephen. Thank you. Uh, so getting seven years ago when you embarked on your own career, so to speak, at the tender age of 26, you were entering a profession not as an, as an employee, but now as an entrepreneur and also an employer. And with many professions, there's certain barriers to entry and there are hurdles that one has to overcome. Um, in those 30 days, did you face many such challenges and in trying to establish your credentials as to who you are? given the fact that you're not a grey head person, but you're young, etc., and to try and get the acceptance and the trust from your clients that you, even though you're 26 and not 56, that you're able to deliver, combined with the fact also that you are a female and not a male, in what could be maybe seen as a predominantly male-dominated industry up until now. Well, it's probably that, uh, <clears throat> name is Tati, I work for UCT. I, I grew up in a family business environment, and the biggest concern with entrepreneurs is that they always forget the family side of things. They actually sacrifice that to actually build business. So, how do you balance your work life situation? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, okay, I'll start with the first question. Um, I actually grew up in a, in, a, in a family where my father was an entrepreneur. He sold 
everything that could be sold except people. <laughs> and um, I think when I started, it was in the, I mean, I remember there was a time I went to see this other advocate, <laughs> and I suppose he wanted to build a house in the Eastern Cape, just doing very well in Joburg. And as I walked into his office, he said, Where's your boss? <laughs> so you are talking to me on the phone. You are going to design my house, it will stand. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, but it's just that you're a little bit younger, you know. <laughs> so I have faced that before and um I think for me is that my father has had instilled so much confidence in me and um, a kind of character that I cannot describe, but it's only through my work that can be described. And because of that, I've never really seen myself less of a male or less of, and, and really understanding, and I'll get to your answer as well. I've never really uh, said I can do everything a man can do at this, because I understand that certain natural things, which I'll get into when I answer your question, you know, like a woman still has to take maternity leave, men don't have to do that, <laughs> you know, and all those things, and they have an effect on women in business. But at the same time, in terms of my credentials, in terms of the, the, that the, the will and the, and I knew that I wasn't that experience. I knew that all I have is passion, is talent, I have the ideas, but I don't have the experience. So what I did, I then sacrificed um, a lot to actually get this other friend of mine who was a little bit older, had a little bit of experience, so like, you will do all these sort of like, you know, uh, things that require someone with experience. And I've always done that, and that's how I've done I've done it until now. I have people that have like 30 years of experience and all that. And I say, you know what, if we're going to grow, we'll need this kind of skill set, you know? If you're going to just hang around with just and say you want to save money or whatever way and say you want young people, you know? And yes, they're young, young people, they're good, they have ideas, they see no failure in life, and all the people will start thinking about problems before solutions. But it's all good because then you're able to combine the different skill set and actually grow. So, um, and at times as well, I remember I went for I went for a meeting at a construction company early this year, um, one of the big, big five in our country, and um, we were sitting in a meeting, and this guy was just very dismissive of me, you know. And um, two weeks later. I think he saw the BBQ magazine and he had read probably my credit. He called me, he's like, oh, you know, I was telling people that I know you. I'm like, it's really <laughs> <laughs> like, So dismissive of me in the meeting because I think he just looked at me and said, how do you know? You probably a window dressing or something. But I know that people are like that. And, and I say, it's okay because they don't know what I know. So it's okay for them to probably have those preconceived ideas because they don't know what I know. You know, and the most important thing is for me to know what I know. Yeah. And is it okay? All right. Last question. Um, I think it's really not about sacrificing. I think a lot of, uh, in the past, people used to say that, um, you know, women in business, it's not good for women to probably go into business because they tend to sacrifice their personal life, they don't get married, they don't have kids. And I think. Women are changing that. Um, you can see that women are changing that at Google, at <laughs> Yahoo, you know, women are taking over and they're saying we can have a family and we can still run the business, you know. And I think we all need each other. Just That's why even our company, we try and make sure that even in terms of um, diversity, we are diversified in terms of skills, in terms of race, because I believe we all need each other, you know? So just as men and women need each other, because I've seen some of our senior male members uh, of our staff, we find that they get excited and all that, but I'll come here and say, I just don't trust that person. They're like, why? I just don't trust them. You know, it's just, women just say, I'm suspecting. They might not have the effect. And you know, that helps, because they sometimes are like, you know, you know, you're right. <laughs> you know, so I think we all need each other. So I have not certainly sacrificed, and I think women are changing that perception that if you go into business, why is that men get married in business, they have kids, women should have the same as well. I mean, I'm getting married this year. Oh. <laughs> 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 not 
about uh, one of the people who asked a question, our young Mr. Nobuyo Rani, who is actually a sterling young entrepreneur and someone really to follow as well. So uh, Nobuyo, I'll be keeping an eye on you. <laughs> and I'd like to ask Suzanne Renick, uh, Britain Renick, Renica of DLA, DLA Cliff Decker Hoffman, to pass on a vote of thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Salad and I'm one of the directors of Cliff Deck Half Man. Um, what a way to end an evening. Thank you for that question. I think it's, it's, it's amazing when those questions are still asked in today's, <laughs> in today's life. But some say location, location, location. Simon Gillis says vision, vision, vision. I think I, I have about five pages of golden nuggets. Um, that you shared with us today. Um, and for me, if nothing else, having a vision and being two and having heart is the stuff I'm taking home with me tonight. So, so thank you very much for being true and being inspiring um, and being so real and, and practical. I think you shared so, so many lessons with us. Um, and even the unspoken, I think just your presence um, has shared so much and we can really learn um, and, and I think for me, what's also important in saying thank you to you is, is thank you for your spirit of Ubuntu. Because without that, you know, you wouldn't share so freely. So we've got a token of appreciation from Mazars DLA and <laughs> UCT. Um, so thank you very much.